All right, this question is for Dan McClellan. All right, let's see it. Can Christianity's ritual of communion, the body and blood of Christ, be traced back to a cannibalistic cult of Dionysus? It's just this argument that if you squint at these two things hard enough, the boundaries will blur and run together, and therefore they are obviously the exact same thing. Wait a minute. So Dr. McClellan's saying, if I squint hard enough at Dionysus and Jesus, they look the same, exactly the same? Let me try this. I see it. There it comes. Jesus and Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, Zagreus, Sabasius, and Liber, both are the Son of God, but not just any of the sons of God. These two are the only two that are chosen to be the heir of the kingdom of heaven itself. They are the Son of God. I will show why Dionysus stands above all other sons of Zeus later in this video, but in short, in the Dionysica by Nonus, as well as other older fragments and legends concerning Dionysus, Zeus, in the form of a dragon, impregnates the perpetual virgin, or Cori, known as Persephone, and chose the child to wield the thunderbolt and become the prince of Olympus and the heir to Zeus's throne a status that no son of Zeus had ever been promised before. Like Jesus, who is the heir of the kingdom of heaven, the Logos, who was one with God. In the same sense, Dionysus, called Sabasius by the Phrygians, was in the bosom of the Father. Dionysus and Jesus both have a mortal mother and are miraculously born. Unlike Jesus, Dionysus has two mothers, one divine, one mortal. But one of them, Persephone, has the epithet Cori, which can mean virgin or young maiden, similar to the Hebrew word Elma used in the famous virgin birth prophecy by Isaiah, cited by Christians and used for Mary and Jesus. Persephone's name was so sacred that it was not permitted to be spoken aloud by mortal lips. So the virgin or Cori was her name and she is who gave birth to Dionysus. And the Dionysica reports that Dionysus, who he calls Zagreus, was conceived during the time when the full moon was seen in Virgo. And two times the author Nonus reports that Virgo is present during the conception. There is also Sabasius, the Phrygian Dionysus, who Diodorus calls the oldest Dionysus, and according to multiple inscriptions and passages from both Diodorus and Cicero, is the son of the great mother Cybele, who, like Mary, holds the title for Mother of God. I will argue that the veneration and worship of Mother Mary has some of its roots of influence in Phrygian Cybele. More on this to come. After Dionysus' death and resurrection, he was born again by a mortal mother, Semele, 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 who was reported to be a virgin according to the commentaries about the wedding between her and Zeus, but no virgin birth in a miracle sense. The text clearly says that she has intercourse with Zeus, and that Zeus loved her more than anyone before her, and the love was real love. Regardless of the details, a mortal virgin miracle birth scene is present in both the Gospels and in the Dionysica legends and fragments. Both of these sons of God entered the world by the will of the Father in heaven, and they both tell this to anyone that doubts them too. Dionysus tells Pentheus that he is doing the will of Zeus in heaven, and Jesus tells the Pharisees that he is doing the will of his father Theos in heaven. They are both born in the Near East, as Homer related that Mount Nisa, the birthplace of Dionysus, was in Lebanon, just a stone's throw away from Nazareth, where Jesus is born. Others like Diodorus and Herodotus thought that Dionysus was born in Arabia or Phoenicia. Other accounts say Mount Nisa is in Asia Minor, but they both end up venerated in the West. Their disciples brought their beliefs from the Near East to Greece and Italy, spreading them everywhere. 
they both shared wine with their followers and used wine in their special ceremonies. They each had their own group of disciples, and many of them were women. Mary Magdalene and Martha are rubbing Jesus' feet with perfumes and alabastrum, while the Maenads do the bidding of Dionysus and carry Thrysoi and aphrodisiacs. Jesus and Dionysus die in violent ways, but are reported to have been bodily resurrected within a matter of days. Jesus and Dionysus, one thing and one thing only from their followers, devotion. At the end of the Bacchae, Dionysus tells Agave that the wages of sin is death and that she is too late to repent for she did not believe in him before the hour was too late. This is the very attitude that Jesus has for people who do not believe in him and will cast into hell when it is too late for repenting. And just as we all were taught that the Christians were persecuted by the Roman Empire, Bacchic followers of Dionysus were outlawed by a Roman decree in 186 BCE, showing evidence that the Dionysian religion was 250 years ahead of Christians as being the persecuted religion of the Romans. Both the early Christians and the Bacchans were promoting a social justice egalitarian worldview that conflicted with the hierarchical traditional ways of Roman religion. By about 150 years after Jesus lived, people started to really notice these similarities and they talked about them a lot. Early second century Christian preachers compared Jesus with Bacchus and later Nonus, a pagan poet who wrote the famous Dionysica, the most extensive mythology of Dionysus in the form of Homeric prose, was reported by church tradition to have converted to Christ and wrote extensively on the Gospel of John, comparing the life of Jesus to the life of Dionysus. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is at a wedding in Cana and turns water into wine. This is like the legends from long ago about Dionysus, who could also make wine in miraculous ways. Pausanias in the second century relates a legend about a temple of Dionysus located in central Greece that was said to have jugs of water converted to wine every year during a Dionysia festival. So when people who believe in many gods heard about Jesus turning water into wine, they would have thought it was very much like what Dionysus could do. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Another phrase that readers of the Gospel of John would hear and think of Dionysus, the true vine God, but could arguably be interpreted as Jesus supplanting Dionysus as the true vine God. By saying this, Jesus was like a new version Dionysus, but even more important. Before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, Dionysus rode into Athens on a donkey and raised the famous poet Aeschylus from the dead. After Dionysus himself descended into Hades and was able to return, like Jesus also was rumored to have done, very few gods in the ancient texts could do these feats. Even when Asclepius tried to raise Hippolytus from death, Zeus angrily killed Asclepius for defying the will of the gods. And Orpheus was unsuccessful in his voyage to Hades to raise his wife Eurycleia. It is Dionysus, like Jesus after him, who was the chosen heir of the kingdom of heaven, the chosen prince of the kingdom of Zeus. Jesus and Dionysus are in direct competition in the first century and second century for supremacy of who is the true Son of God. But these details about miracles and actions that Jesus and Dionysus have in common are small in comparison to the deeper Dionysian connections of Jesus Christ, in my opinion. It gets much deeper than just comparing miracles and both being sons of God who brutally die and resurrect. It gets into the fabric of the religious attitudes of the first century Greco-Roman world the heart of the Middle Platonist mystery religion world, Asia, Syria, Judea, and Egypt. The religious movements in this region that Christianity is born from has Dionysian elements at the heart of it all. The heartbeat of Daisy Daemon, Daisy Domania, or Theosabasia, which are two terms in Greek that mean God-fearing, both terms used by the Apostle Paul and by church fathers. It is a Dionysian technical term, which etymologically, theosabasia, which most know as God-fearing, 
also used to mean God inspired and contains the name Sabazio, the title of Dionysus, and Daisy Demonia, which Paul also uses in the book of Acts and is translated as God fearing or religious, breaks down etymologically as religious feeling of being inspired by God and is purely Dionysian as any classicist or philologist will tell you. Or if you check the Liddell Scott Encyclopedia of Greek word usage, the word is either used negatively to describe superstitions or more positively in the cultic sense as the feeling gained from aphrodisiacs, entheogens, or the god Dionysus himself entering into the soul or psyche of the mortal human being. Dionysus is the principal god of religious inspiration through mania. Deci daemon, the inspiration of the god that enters the soul of the adherents or cultic initiates. Feeling the Holy Spirit and having Christ enter your heart is by definition Deci Daemonia, the entheogen Kaikion, would allow one to feel the Holy Spirit of Dionysus and Demeter. The two principal parts of this sacred cup, or Eucharist, was also bread and wine, grain and grapevine, the body and blood of Christ. Early churches called Ecclesia typically were operated in democratic fashion that are typical for Athenian and Corinthian Dionysiac groups. Some were even called Baptist or Bapti in Greek. Members of these Dionysiac Baptist groups had titles given to the initiates, such as Torch Bearer, Temple Bearer, Christ Bearer, titles that we also see with early Christ assemblies in the Roman Empire, which I will discuss at length later. In this video, I will demonstrate how deep the Dionysian roots of Christianity goes, and trust me, it goes deeper than I can even grasp myself. Please hit that like button, subscribe if you have not yet done so, and leave a comment about what you think about this, and share it to your friends who love Christianity and mythology. Let's get into this. The Gospel of John shares a notable narrative resemblance with Euripides' play The Bacchae. In both stories, the central character is a deity who assumes human form, lives among humans, and faces rejection from his own community. This conflict forms the core of both narratives, yet they diverge greatly in their conclusions. Bacchae ends tragically, leaving its main characters either deceased or shattered, ultimately leading to the collapse of the Theban royal family. In a poignant finale, King Cadmus, initially shown as devout for his faith in God, confronts Dionysus, critiquing the godlike wrath by stating, it is not right that gods resemble mortals in their outrages. This challenges the righteousness of Dionysus' retribution. Conversely, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, portrayed as God incarnate, does not seek vengeance but offers eternal life setting up a stark contrast to Euripides' violent Dionysus with Jesus depicted as benevolent world savior. These parallels are primarily found in the original version of the Gospel of John. Subsequent versions by later authors don't expand on the Dionysian aspects, suggesting that the likeness to Dionysus are specific to the first version penned by the Johannine evangelist. Various academics have explored the similarities between John's Gospel and Euripides' Bacchae, though there's no consensus on direct imitation between the two works. John might not have intentionally recrafted the Bacchae, but my contention is that he subconsciously selected the tragic mythological framework while reshaping his narrative about Jesus making the resemblances to the Euripides' tale about Dionysus somewhat unavoidable. At this point, it's crucial to clarify that I am not suggesting John's writings were directly influenced by Euripides in a literary sense. Harvard professor Dennis R. MacDonald, in two peer-reviewed books, The Gospels and Homer, Imitations of Greek Epic and Mark and Luke Acts, and Luke and Virgil, Imitations of Classical Greek Literature. Professor MacDonald employed a methodology that has come down to be known as mimesis criticism. His work utilizes these analytical criteria to show the similarities between John and the Bacchae. Dr. MacDonald illustrates that the Johannine evangelist not only emulated Euripides, but also also anticipated his audience to regard Jesus as superior to Dionysus. 
Professor Carl A. P. Rupp, also a classical philologist from Harvard, has written extensively on the Dionysian roots of Christianity, in particular the Eucharist. The Road to Eleusis is a classic book that was criticized heavily by lazy academics who were not immersed in the material, but his work was later vindicated as the years went by. He shows the Eucharist rituals of the Dionysian religion is practiced by the early Christians. The heresiologist Hippolytus even discusses earlier sects of Christians performing Eucharistic rituals involving hallucinogens and making purple wine. This caused magic visions and the Holy Spirit to take over the initiates of Christ. Regardless of how the later church viewed these rites, heresy or not, they admittedly were done by high-level ranking Christian bishops in Rome, and these groups were extremely popular and had huge followings. The Nicenes, Valentinians, Carpocratians, who had titles of Magus, and synced Jesus with Dionysus, as well as Attis, Adonis, Osiris, and others. Many academics will write these Christians off as heretics who somehow don't count, without realizing that they themselves are being bound by the dogmas of the later Middle Ages Orthodox Church, who try to distance themselves from their own past. The so-called heretics and Gnostics who performed these rites and made these connections between Jesus and the Dionysian were closer to Jesus than the church under Constantine was. Even Justin Martyr, the face of proto-orthodoxy, in his apology, continually compares Jesus to Dionysus, who he admits is the resurrected Son of God, to Mercury, who he admits is called the Logos of God, to Hercules, who he says was the Son of God whose passion saved the world, and Asclepius, the Son of God who raised the dead, as well as Mithras, the Son of God who gave Eucharist and ritual salvation. Even Paul himself wrote in his letters that sacrificing to other gods is permitted because he knew that these are the cults that the message of Christ would thrive under. The ways in which the fourth Gospel of John, the most Gnostic leaning of all the four main Gospels, diverges from the three Synoptic Gospels can be understood through its imitations of the Bacchae. Mark's narrative centers on the revelation of the messianic secret. Matthew constructs this story around the Jewish traditions, continuation, and Jesus' new revelation. And Luke highlights the birth of a new religious movement and its global spread. In contrast, the author of the first Johannine Gospel shapes his story with a clear emphasis on Jesus' divine origins and the resulting dichotomy between the acceptance and rejection of his openly declared divine nature. This narrative approach shows parallels to Euripides' portrayal of Dionysus. The fourth gospel begins by identifying its protagonist as God. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was divine. This one at the beginning was with God. Like John's gospel, the Bacchae begins with the God declaring his identity the Son of God has come into the world to the Thebans. Dionysus, whom Semele, daughter of Cadmus, once bore, induced to do so by a lightning bolt, after having changed himself into human form from that of a god. Not only do these introductions to these tragedies introduce the Son of God, but they also highlight the oneness of both the Son of God with God. The Logos is with God, but also the Bacchae makes it clear that Dionysus is entering the world into the flesh like the Logos and leaving the bosom of the Father. Once again, we can see what Clement of Alexandria meant in his Percepticus when he says, God in the bosom is a countersign to Sabasius. To show you what he means, Sabasius is the godhead of Zeus and Dionysus together as one. As Zeus sows the heart of Zagreus into his thigh and gives birth to Dionysus. Dionysus in the thigh of Zeus is what the Orphics call Sabasius. To prove this claim, let's examine the Orphic hymn to Sabasius. To Sabasius, fumigation from aromatics. Hear me, illustrious father, Daemon famed, great Saturn's offspring, Sabasius named, inserting Bacchus, bearer of the vine, and founding God within thy thigh divine, that when mature the Dionysian god must burst the bands of his concealed abode. Sabasius is called the son of Kronos or Saturn, which is usually Zeus, Hades, or Poseidon. Here, Dionysus and Zeus are one, both son of Kronos, both being brought into the world. The Logos from John was originally a title of Zeus. 
son of Kronos, was given by the Stoics as the noose or mind of God, incorporeal, immaterial Zeus, in a different sense than Mercury, who was also given the title of Logos by the Hermetic cult in Egypt for being Zeus's messenger or angel, Angelos. Philo of Alexandria, who is contemporary with Jesus and Paul, as well as being a supporter of Caesar Augustus, although not a fan of Caligula, said this in his On Creation. The corporeal world was then completed, having its seat in the divine logos, and the physical world, perceptible to the senses, was made on the model of it. In the first portion of it, the most excellent of all, made by the Demiurge, was heaven, which he truly called the firmament, as being corporal. For the body is by nature firm, insomuch as it is divisible by three parts, corporal, incorporeal, and spiritual. Here we see Philo employ a Platonic, arguably proto-Trinitarian view of God, creating the world through his logos that goes from immaterial spirit to material matter. This is how Jesus is introduced into the Gospel of John, but this is also exactly how Dionysus, or Sabasius, is presented in the Bacchae and Orphic hymns as being one with the God who stands outside of space and time, who creates his son from himself, gives birth to himself, places his spirit into the body of a mortal woman. Clement's citation of God in the bosom of the Father is a countersign to the adepts of Sabasius can be directly found in John's Gospel, Dionysian Gospel, as John 1.18 states, No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. Some have even translated this to say, in the lap of the Father, which is even more akin to the image of Dionysus in the thigh of Zeus. As Dennis MacDonald points out in his peer-reviewed book, The Dionysian Gospel, the sequence of events in which these characters are introduced are nearly identical, with each analogous to each other, operating with similar purposes in the plot. Dionysus entering the world, taking on flesh after being one with the Father, just as Jesus the Logos enters the world as flesh after being one with the Father. Cadmus is introduced by Euripides and praised as a forerunner, someone who is described with clustering foliage of the grapevine, but not Dionysus, who is the vine god. In a very eerie similar fashion, John introduces John the Baptist as not the light, but the one to testify to the true light. The crowds in the gospel, like the chorus of satyrs and maenads in the Bacchae, jumping in from time to time to chant, the Theban women in the Bacchae who believe in Dionysus and accept him, even as a mysterious stranger, like the Samaritan woman who accepts Jesus and believes in him blind seer, Tiresias, who is given the power of sight in the form of prophecy from the god Dionysus, who he praises, just as the blind man in the gospel is given sight from Jesus in a literal sense and praises Jesus. King Cadmus, who halfway believes in Dionysus, but has some doubts, just as Nicodemus is portrayed in the gospel. And of course, the most obvious parallel is Pentheus, the prince, who is also the religious authority of Thebes, and is the main opposition to Dionysus and his religious movement, just as we see the Pharisees, the religious authority in Israel, who oppose Jesus and his movement. The assistants of Pentheus, who are ordered to arrest Dionysus, but find no fault in him, just as Pilate is to arrest Jesus, but finds no fault in him. Finally, the twist, because Pentheus is who was killed at the end, not Dionysus, who was already resurrected, but Pentheus is placed on top of a tree and ripped apart by the Maenads, one of them being his own mother, possessed by Dionysus, and she repents after she comes and realizes that her son is dead. Jesus, who was crucified, is visited by his mother, who weeps over her dying son. Dionysus is disguised as a mortal, coming to enact justice on Thebes, and revealed to be divine, is analogous to Jesus, not revealing his true nature until his resurrection. Both Dionysus and Jesus are not received by their home nations, but both end up in triumph for witnesses to believe in after. The sequence of events is on point, and the Gospel of John is following the mimesis of tragedy laid down by Euripides Bacchae. 
A similar argument is made by Dr. John Moles in his peer-reviewed article, Jesus and Dionysus in the Acts of the Apostles and Early Christianity, laying out the broad thematic parallels between Acts and the Bacchae, including disruptive impact of a new god, judicial proceedings against new god and his followers, bondage of new god and his followers, imprisonment of new god's followers, their generally miraculous escapes from prison, divine epiphanies. More on this argument later. Professor Harold W. Atridge suggests that the quasi-poetic form of John's prologue is not a secondary and casual addition to the gospel. It belongs where it sits at the beginning of the complex gospel. Unlike any other gospels, the fourth gospel John begins as a drama. If one wants to understand the narrative rhetoric of the gospel, it is important to attend to the drama of the gospel. Many scholars have noticed the tragedy, poetic style of John's gospel. We also know that the Hellenistic and Byzantine and Roman education systems taught people to read and write Greek by copying the classics, such as Homer and Euripides. It is not far-fetched in any stretch to suggest that the author of St. John's Gospel was using the Bacchae as a template to construct his own gospel tragedy. Clement of Alexandria noticed these parallels and wrote about them. The difference are what matters the most, not the similarities, which is the sequence and imagery. But Jesus is an anti-Dionysus, and Dionysus is an antichrist. To go back to Clement of Alexandria, he lays this out for me perfectly as he describes the mystery of Christ using Bacchic imagery in Protrepticus. Come, O madman, not propped up by a thrysis, not wreathed with ivy, throw off your headband, throw off your fawn skin, get sober. I will show you the logos and the mysteries of the logos, and I will describe them with your own imagery. This mountain is beloved of God, and it's subject to tragedies like Catherion. Bacchic mountain prominent in the Bacchae, but exalted by dramas of truth, a sober mountain and shaded by chaste woods. Reveling here are no maenads, daughters of thunder-stricken Semele, initiates in the disgusting distribution of raw flesh. Instead, they are daughters of God, the beautiful lambs who utter the solemn rites of the Logos and gather together a sober chorus. This chorus consists of the righteous, and their song is a hymn to the king of all, Young girls pluck their instruments, angels sing praises, prophets speak, the sound of music carries. Quickly they follow the Theosos, those who were called Skorioth, longing to welcome the Father. It's interesting that Clement uses the imagery of distributing raw flesh as the initiates of Bacchus, when in a spiritual sense, the initiates of Jesus Christ also eat the flesh of Christ in the Eucharist. Later in the same book, Clement calls Christ a new Orpheus, singing a song of salvation, invoking the same Bacchic Orphic imagery laid down throughout this video. Orpheus was the theologian, Theos Logos, etymologically breaking down into God's word, and Orpheus was the revealer, or the apocalypse, of prophetic wisdom given by Dionysus and Apollo, who he was high priest and son of. Jesus, like Orpheus, reveals a new apocalypse for a new world, who he is high priest and son of this god, the god Theos. And both Jesus and Orpheus sing hymns as they die. Jesus is reciting psalms on the cross, and Orpheus is chanting Orphic hymns as he is torn apart by the Maenads in the river Hebrus. According to the church tradition of Catholicism and Orthodoxy, there are three events that are said to have taken place on the same day but in different years. The first event being the birth of Christ, also known as the Epiphany, in which the three Magi visit the newborn child in the Manger. The early church, corroborated by the earliest sources, indicates that they believe this took place on January 6th, 12 days after the winter solstice, hence the 12 days of Christmas. Epiphanius of Salamis reports that this was the day Christ was born, at the same time as other predating pagan festivals. Christ was born on the sixth day of January, after 13 days of the winter solstice, and of the light and day of addition. But this day is celebrated by the Greeks and also by the pagans on the 6th of January, called by the Roman Saturnalia, by the Egyptians Cronia, and by the Alexandria Cachelia 
According to multiple sources, the Alexandrian church was the first to venerate the birth of Christ on this day, and this was started by the Basilideans, a Gnostic sect from Alexandria from the late 1st early 2nd century. 30 years later, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist on this exact same day of January 6th, according to the church, and the same Basilideans asserted that the Feast of the Epiphany was to be celebrated on the same day. But the followers of the early Christian Gnostic Basilides celebrate the day of his baptism too, spending the previous night in readings, and they say that it was on the 15th of Tybee, January 6th, of the 15th year of Tiberius. The baptism of Christ, along with the birth of Christ, are two of the three events that are celebrated at the Feast of the Epiphany on January 6th. The third event is an odd one. The church asserts that the wedding at Cana, when Jesus turns water into wine, also occurred on January 6th and was also venerated at this Feast of the Epiphany, possibly due to this being the first miracle that occurs in the Gospel of John. But I think there could also be a Dionysian layer to this. In that same passage from Epiphanius about Christ being born on January 6th, he goes on to say something that is truly remarkable for this discussion. They answer and say that at this hour, today, the Virgin gave birth to Ion. And this is also done in the city of Petra, and in the Arabic dialect, praising the Virgin, calling her Kori, that is, Virgin, and Dusaris, she gave birth to, that is, the Virgin's only son. And this also happens in Elusa, in the city, the same night, January 6th, as they're in Petra in Alexandria, Egypt. It turns out that both of these gods mentioned here, Ion and Dusaris, the former Greek, the latter Arabic, are gods who are closely connected and even identified with Dionysus by many of the contemporary sources. But it gets even deeper. The ancient Greeks had a Dionysian epiphany feast celebrated on the night of the 5th of January into the 6th of January. It was also a smaller feast that came roughly 12 days following a winter solstice festival known as Heloa or the rural Dionysia, celebrated during the week of the winter solstice which was occurring on December 25th of the Julian calendar. This January 6th Epiphany Festival for Dionysus was also mentioned by Pliny the Younger in the early 2nd century, so we can be certain that this feast was around during the rise of early Christianity and was well known. According to Pliny, in the Temple of Dionysus at Andros, there is a fountain that tastes like wine every year on the 5th of January, a date called Theodosia. It is this exact same location, the Temple of Dionysus at Andros and Elis, that Pausanias, in his Geography of Greece, relates that jars are miraculously filled to the brim with wine by the god for his festival. Anna Isabel, Jimenez San Cristobal, writes extensively on this in a peer-reviewed article titled The Epiphany of Dionysus and Elis and the Miracle of Wine. Pausanias writes, the Elians worship Dionysus with the greatest reverence, and they assert that the god attends their festival. Three jars are brought into the building by the priest and set down empty in the presence of the citizens and of any strangers who may chance to be in the country. The doors of the building are sealed by the priests themselves and by any others who may be so inclined. On the morrow, they are allowed to examine the seals and on going into the building, they find the jars filled with wine. This means that not only are Jesus and Dionysus both turning water into wine, but they both have Epiphany Feast on January 6th, which in fact also venerates the wedding at Cana, a literal wine miracle story, as well as the legends about Dionysus making wine for this event. And on top of this, three major cities in the east, Alexandria, Elusa, and Petra, all have similar epiphany feasts honoring other gods who are born of a virgin on the same day as Jesus, called Dusharis and Ion, who are both identified with Dionysus by several authors. Both Plotinus and Proclus assert that Ion is just another avatar of Dionysus, and the Byzantine Suda identifies Ion as a syncretic Osiris Adonis and Attis, which makes things even more tempting to say 
the character of Christ in John's Gospel could be influenced by the same dying and rising agricultural paradigm. Jarl Fossum, who was the professor at Michigan University in a peer-reviewed article, wrote that Ion is a form of Osiris Dionysus, resurrected annually. His image was marked with crosses on his hands, knees, and forehead. Dr. Fossum lays out yet another parallel between the virgin-born Ion with Dionysus, saying that Cori, the virgin, was a title for Persephone and was only mentioned giving birth to one god in hundreds of texts, myths, and fragments that mention her, and that is Zagreus, also called Sabasius by Diodorus, both being the firstborn Dionysus. The birth of the child in the gloomy cavern is also depicted in both Mithraic temples and Sabazian art. Here on the right hand of Sabazius, we see the mother giving birth to the child in the cave, and again in the Mithraeum in Ostia, an identical image of the child and the mother is present. The god Ion is in many ways a syncretic god of Mithras and Dionysus, which I will show shortly. And keep in mind, the rise of the Ion cult is running parallel to the Jesus movement at the end of the 1st century through the 5th century. Ion, as we see in this artwork, dug from Antioch, Syria, dated to the 2nd century, showing Ion at a supper with three of his disciples called Kronoi, although it turns out that these Kronoi are three avatars of Ion himself representing the three cycles of time, past, present, and future, and an almost trinity aspect of the god Ion, if you will. Similar images of Jesus can be found during contemporary times. Jesus, young, not bearded, often looking like a magician, sitting at a supper with his disciples. This is also common among Dionysian paintings as well as Mithraic. We can easily determine the influences of the Dionysian on the Ion culture, and I think this is just the same influencing of the Dionysian on Christianity. This was the cultural milieu in which Christianity grew up in and competed with. Here at the Museum of Chicago is an early Jesus sculpture. It appears very feminine and was thought to be a goddess or a woman when first discovered. Only later did they realize that this was an early statue of Jesus, but also based on an earlier model used for both Apollo and Dionysus. Putting them side by side, you almost can't even tell that they are separate deities. Similar statues are used for Adonis, Mithras, Attis, and Aya. These savior gods are competing, but in the pagan world, they are synchronized. Crobius in his Saturnalia argues that Apollo and Dionysus are the same god born at the winter solstice, and he says they are both called Yao. Apollo is the same as Sol. These things which we have said of Apollo may also be thought to have been said of Dionysus, for Aristotle, who wrote the Theologumena called Apollo, Sol, and Liber Pater Dionysus are one and the same god. He goes on to say, For in the sacred arcane religious observance is held, so that when the sun is in the upper, that is, in the daytime hemisphere, Apollo is invoked, when in the underworld, that is, at night, Dionysus. Now these differences of ages are related to the sun, so that at the winter solstice, December 25th, this god is a newborn child, Macrobius. In the next passage, Macrobius calls this syncretic deity, Yao which is the same name of the god Yahweh in the oldest fragments of the Greek Septuagint found in Qumran. Citing Orpheus as his source, he says, Zeus, Helios, Apollo, and Dionysus are all one god called Yao, the supreme deity. The mysteries must be kept hidden and far from the uninitiated. But if you possess little wisdom in our restless mind, understand that the highest god is Yao, who is Hades in winter, Zeus at the start of the spring, Apollo, Helios in summer, and gentle Bacchus, Yao, in the autumn, Orpheus. The chant Yao 
was a common Bacchic chant that was shouted during Dionysian revelry and festivals, being the precursor to the Roman Yo. Interestingly, this title for Yao, for Dionysus, shows up again in the Chaldean oracles in relation to the Semitic Phoenician language. Dionysus, or Bacchus, was called by the Chaldeans Yao, in the light of the world, in the Phoenician tongue. And he is frequently called Saboeth, such as he who was above the seven poles, called Demiurge, Chaldean oracles. This syncretic Dionysian god was so widespread during the first three centuries of the Common Era that his presence was felt in every corner and beyond the Roman Empire. In Corinth and in Athens, the Dionysian religion of Codus was called Bapti or Baptist in English and practiced water immersion rites and Eucharist involving kaikion made from beer and wine grain and vine. The character of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, though based on a historical person, is still in direct competition with the syncretic religions of the Roman imperial cult, Mithras Sol Invictus, and Greco-Syrian deities like Ion, Adonis, or Egyptian Serapis. In a similar way, the legends of Augustus and Caesar although based on real people, are also modeled off different mythologies like Romulus or Apollo. At this time, when Christianity was on the rise in the Roman Empire as the main competition of the Greek mystery religions and the Roman imperial cult, there was another reoccurring holy symbol of iconography, like the symbol of Christ on the cross. This symbol was central to the cult of Mithras Sol Invictus, the image of Mithras slaying the bull. Mithras, who is also equated with Apollo by both Persians and Greeks, as shown here in the inscription that shows Mithras Helios Apollo next to King Antiochus. But there is also a Dionysian layer that is even more interesting and I think it shows close proximity to Christ as a sin offering. An inscription reads, Christos Pater Kai Garos Eboisan, consecrated by Father Christos and Garos. We see Mithras slaying a bull with a snake and a dog feasting on its blood. In the corners, we see Sol and Luna, who are also equated with the twins, Apollo and Diana Lucifera. Identical images like this are found all throughout the Roman Empire, thousands even. Sol and Luna, are also flanked by Lucifer and Vesper, like angels bringing light. Crobius tells us that Janus, the two-headed god of time, is the Latin version of Ion, but he also says that Janus is linked to Saturn, or Kronos, time, just as Ion is a time god. More on this later. Etched on the bowl is the name of Dio Sol Invictus Mithra, God Sol Invictus Mithra, and at the head of the bowl is the words Nama Sabazio, an ancient Indo-European dialect states, give thanks to Sabazius. It turns out that this bowl represents Sabazius, who is Dionysus, who is the offering that brings salvation. In numerous texts, Dionysus or Sabazius was referred to as a bowl or a ram. In Diodorus' account, he is the chosen heir of the ram god Amon and was the horned child of Amon, which technically would make him the lamb of God, since a baby ram is literally a lamb. Amon had prophesied the inhabitants that at an appointed time his son Dionysus would come and that he would recover his father's kingdom and, after becoming master of all the inhabited world, would be looked upon as God. Dionysus, believing him to have been a true prophet, established there the oracle of his father, rebuilt the city and ordained honors to him as a god and appointed men to have charge of the oracle. Tradition has also recorded that Amon had the head of a ram that in very truth there were little horns on both sides of his temples and that therefore Dionysus also being Amon's son had the same aspect as his father and so the tradition has been handed down to succeeding generations of mankind that this god had horns. More often than this 
Dionysus was called bull-horned. In an Olympian ceremonial song dedicated to Hera, Dionysus is summoned in the guise of a bull, described as raging with bull foot. Walter Burkett notes that Dionysus often appears with bull horns in art, and in Kisikos, he is depicted in a bull-like form. Burkett also mentions an ancient tale where Dionysus, embodied as a young bull, is brutally slaughtered in a sacrifice and sacrilegiously consumed by the Titans. I call upon you, blessed, many-named, and frenzied Bacchus, bull-horned Nisian redeemer, god of the winepress, conceived in fire, orphic hymn to Bacchus. Other hymns go on to say that he is bull-faced. Dionysus may have had origins in Crete, where the sacred bull was especially venerated, rural, ineffable, two-form, obscure, two-horned, ivy-crowned, ewan, pure, bull-faced, martial, bearer of the vine, Orphic hymn to Dionysus. Dionysus' most frequent manifestation is as a bull in Greek art and religious symbolism, representing his strength, leadership, fertility, and his overwhelming natural force. His bull-like aspect is often referenced in worship and poetry. Notably, Dionysus and his sacrificial bulls offered in his rites shared a common form. This is evident in Euripides' Bacchae, where the Maenads violently dismember bulls during the ritualistic Speragmos, as recounted by the cowherd. In the case of Pentheus, he perceives Dionysus as a bull. He attempts to bind the stranger, but ends up grappling with the bull in the royal stables, in the form that Dionysus took on. Under the influence of madness, the stranger appears to him as a bull. Some writers of myths, however, relate that there was a second Dionysus who was much earlier in time than the one we have just mentioned, for according to them, there was born of Zeus and Persephone, Cori, Dionysus, who was called by some Sabasius, and whose birth and sacrifices and honors are celebrated at night and in secret. They state also that he excelled in sagacity and was the first to attempt the yoking of oxen and by their aid to effect the sowing of seed, this being the reason why they also represent him with bull horns, Diodorus of Sicily. In another hymn to Dionysus, he is called the son of dark Isis, which is a reference to Dionysus twice born nature and his connections with both Osiris and Horus. Diodorus, Herodotus, Cicero, and many other ancient accounts agree that Dionysus and Osiris are one and the same god, for no gods are worshipped by all Egyptians in common, except Isis and Osiris who they say is Dionysus. These are worshipped by all alike. Osiris is, in the Greek language, Dionysus, Herodotus. During the Hellenistic era, Osiris became Serapis by adding the Apis bowl with Osiris. Osar plus Apis, you get Serapis. Like Dionysus, Serapis has his bowl form. Sabasius, one of the many titles of Dionysus, is often linked to a lunar or solar bull. The bull is often depicted on the countless hands of Sabasius, iconography, further connecting the bull to Sabasius. To solidify that Sabasius is the bull being sacrificed by Mithras, in the Vatican Museum, a rare sculpture of Sabasius from Phrygia is displayed. The sculpture shows a bust of Sabasius with the Dionysian pine cone in the hand. In front of Sabasius, there is Mithras figure in the typical pose from the bull's murder. However, there is no bull. Instead, Mithra has stabbed the knife in Sabasius. The expression on Sabasius's face is unambiguous. Sabasius is dying. This, in my opinion, tells us that we should have no doubts. The bull sacrificed by Mithras for salvation of the world is none other than Sabasius, who is Dionysus. And just as Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, Dionysus is the sacrificial bull. Agriculture is inaugurated once again by the god as the tail of the collapsing bull turns into ears of grain. Walter Burkett. The Taurobolium, central to the mysteries of the Great Mother and Attis, which later became syncretized with the Mithraic mysteries in the Roman imperial cult, had initiates enter a chamber surrounded by Bacchic dancers flutes and drums, and the priests would cut the bowl and the blood would drop down into the chamber, and the initiate would then be washed in the blood of the bowl 
Just in the same way, the initiates of Christ would become symbolically washed in the blood of the Lamb. The parallels are too striking to ignore. In fact, in other ancient images of Dionysus, we can see his whole body is like lush grapes. And the same dog and snake seen in the Mithraic images are also seen flanking Dionysus, whose flesh is literal grapes. The dog and the snake, from both the painting of Dionysus and the Mithraic Tarabolums, represent the levels of initiation of the Roman imperial cult. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Jesus in John 655. Somebody living in the late first century in the Greek-speaking world would immediately hear this and think of the Dionysian imagery obviously borrowed from. In the eastern realms of the Roman Empire, in northern Syria, eastern Turkey, and in Persia, the image of the horse rider, the solar hero and mediator of the Most High God to the goddess Anahita. In the western realms of Turkey and Phrygia, and more north in Thrace, similar, almost identical images of the horse rider is Sabasius, also a solar hero, mediator, consort of the Great Mother, Sibylle. The Thracians give Dionysus the name Sabasios and call their priests Sabios. In another fragment cited by Macrobius, Alexander Polyhistor in the first century BC said that in Thrace the sun is Apollo and Liber or Dionysus are one and the same deity called Sabasios. Macrobius also tells us that both Apollo and Dionysus, who are called the same god, Sabasios, are also called Yao. In a passage a couple paragraphs later, also called Sabasius, is born on the winter solstice. This Sabasius was the main consort to the Thracian great mother Codus, or Bendis, who is described as a crossover between Sibylle and Persephone and is called both virgin and mother of God. Sabasius is sometimes depicted with three heads, signifying his triad nature, being Zeus, Dionysus, and Helios Apollo in one godhead. Even farther north, the Dacians and Gitai honor the sun as Zelmoxis, who, according to Herodotus, is the only god they worship. But once a mortal man, they became deified, and his name, Zelmoxis, is Thracian for earthborn, Zemeli being earth, and the roots for the name Semele, the mortal mother of Dionysus. This Zalmoxis, who was called Gebelesis in other texts, breaks down in the same way, but replaces Semele with Gebeli or Sibeli. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the same god in a different language, on a different evolutionary path, but connected deeply through their common Pelasgian ancestry. In both cases, the great mother, mother and consort of the God, who is both father and son. This is strikingly similar to Jesus being one with his father and being born of the virgin mother, God. Keep in mind, we are talking about the same geographical location that the early Christian church was first shown in the sources. Bithynia, where the first Christians are found singing hymns to the dawn in the passages of Pliny the Younger, and the seven churches of Asia in Revelation are in the core region where this Sabasian religion thrived. The question then becomes, did Christianity get influenced by this triad after the Gospels, or is this baked in the text? It is not clear if Paul's epistles or the Gospel writers had a Trinitarian Godhead in mind at all, especially one with the Virgin Mary in place of the Holy Spirit which we see in Eastern Orthodox circles in early church texts. The Great Mother of the Son of God, who is depicted as immortal, or in some cases, the Great Mother, who is immortal. Either way, in consort or mother of the God, who no doubt is depicted in iconography as the horse-riding hero. Throughout Thrace and Turkey, we see this iconography all over the place, and the Great Mother is the most venerated figure throughout the entire Mediterranean world by the first century. 
century, especially after being imported by the Romans on a prophecy written in the Sibylline Oracles, the same Sibylline Oracles that are later taken over by the Greek Orthodox Christians. The great mother of all, this goddess has traces all the way back to the Stone Age. That is correct. Magna Mater, or Sibylle in Phrygia, the very location where Christianity thrives in, where we have the most important goddess of arguably all time, and most ancient according to any of the sources of antiquity. So famous, in fact, that when she was imported to Rome in 204 BC by the Roman Republic on the orders of the Sibyl, the priest at that time thought she had helped them win wars and conquer the Mediterranean, and being the mother of Augustus, who was prophesied in the Sibyl, being her son, priest of the mother of the gods, as he beat his timbrel, seest how a wanton's finger sways the world. The Sibylline oracles were pagan at this time, but these same exact Sibylline oracles slowly begin to Christianize and are now, even now, utilized by the Orthodox Church and were used by the priests to invoke propaganda during the Crusades against Muslims told to reject Baphomet. These are the same Sibylline oracles that demanded the Romans to import the Phrygian goddess Sibylle, who was renamed Magna Mater and they went to war against Mithridates VI. This may be controversial to many Christians, but I don't care because it's true. You can read the Sibylline Oracles in James Charlesworth's Pseudopigrapha and see for yourself how the pagan Sibylline Oracles slowly go from purely pagan to being slightly Judaized and then becoming purely Christian. This is what possibly led to the concept of Mother Mary, Mother of God. Magna Mater was called Mother of the Gods long before Mary was called mother of God. Common folk, who normally are mixing religions, as we can see in the Greek magical papyri, would have easily identified Virgin Mother Mary with Virgin Magda Mater. It was then most likely established by orthodoxy over time that Mary, the mother of God, sneakily and stealthily replaced the role of Magda Mater, and this Mother Mary iconography was everywhere. Mary, the mother of God, was even prayed to. Some early Christian tombstones don't even have the name Jesus or Christ or even God on them. Holy Virgin drew with her hands from a fountain, and this faith ever gives to its friends to eat, having wine of great virtue and giving it mingled with bread. This Christian gravestone, this early saint from Cappadocia, says no mention of the word Christ, Jesus, Father, or God, but there is a holy virgin and a Dionysian imagery of a Eucharist, bread and wine. Paul's letters and the early Gospels show no signs of anyone praying to Mary, so this idea can't be native to Judeo-Christian theology must have been imported from the local region of Magda Mater worship. In fact, the Dionysian Sibelian imagery found in this region is through the roof, showing transitional fossils, in my opinion, from the Sibelian to the Christian religion. The gods Sabasius and Mithras both are commonly depicted in identical ways as horse riders in Persia and Armenia, as well as in Syria and Lebanon. We can see Mithra riding the horse, wearing his Phrygian hat, holding a spear, flanked by an eagle and a snake and a dog. This identical image is also present with Sabasius, who we have also already established is a distant avatar of the god Dionysus from the east in the regions of Cappadocia, Macedonia, Thrace. Phrygia, Caria, Ionia, Thessaly, and even some parts of northern and central Greece. The horse riding savior, flanked by his eagle, holding his spear, stomping on a snake, and dominates the region. But it goes even deeper, as I mentioned, farther north, past the Bosporus Strait, and beyond Thrace and Macedonia, is Zalmoxis territory, whose name, according to Aristotle and a few other ancient Greek writers, means Semele's son, making him a northern rendering of the god Dionysus. He is riding the horse, flanked by a bird, holding a spear, and stomping and stabbing a serpent or a dragon. Zalmoxis, being the son of the Dacian goddess named Zemele, whose name is the Dacian Gaia or Earth, proves without a shadow of a doubt that Zalmoxis is the Chthonic solar Dionysus born from the Earth Goddess. In Lithuania, a god named Zemliuktis is the son of the Sky Father, King, and Earth Mother Goddess. Queen, depicted as fruit-bearing ram or lamb that brought wine and fruits for humanity. 
further establishing that this god is none other than a distant cousin of the great god Dionysus. Down in the southern regions of Syria, this same image is used for Mithras, riding a horse holding a spear flanked by a bird of some kind, this image being the archetype for the savior hero archetype. Mithras, rather than slaying Sebazio the bull, is Sebazio the horse rider, showing that these phases of the sun and moon are interchangeable throughout lands, culture, geography, language, and purpose. The very image of the horse rider with the spear and the eagle became the blueprint for Saint George, the early Christian saint who slays the serpent with his spear and rides on a horse. But there is an undeniable reason why this image of the horse rider is Dionysian and not just a coincidence of two similar looking images. What if I told you that this image of Saint George killing the dragon, the very medieval image that the Lord of Rings and countless other popular motifs is modeled after, is none other than an image modeled off an even older image that is purely Dionysian, as I have shown. Saint Demetrius of Thessalonica is a horse riding hero whose name means Demeter's son in Greek, and he is also depicted as the horse rider holding the spear like Sabasius, Zalmoxis, and Mithras before him. church fathers of the 7th century claim that St. Demetrius during the 5th century was the final hierophant of the Eleusinian Mysteries, a religion that is central to Dionysus. The legend states that the goddess Demeter, who is sometimes considered as a consort to Dionysus, visited Demetrius in a dream and told him to worship Christ and transfer her rights onto Christ. An ancient Orthodox church still stands today where the Eleusinian Mysteries once stood. St. Demetrius's church, one of the biggest churches that stood in the ancient Roman world, besides the Hagia Sophia and a couple others. Some sources suggest that the last hierophant of the Eleusinian Mysteries at the time of Theodosius in 475 was also a level 7 potter of the Mithraic mysteries. This horse rider god hero is seen everywhere. In Dura Europas, Mithras is seen as the horse rider who triumphs over the elements of chaos and is the hero who saves mankind. Hundreds, maybe thousands of images of Mithras as the horse rider are found all throughout Mesopotamia, the Mediterranean, and in Europe. They were even found on Roman coins from the Severan dynasty, and these images are interchangeable with Mithras slaying the bull. There is, of course, Jesus as the horse rider, which may very well be also influenced by these horse rider hero depictions, but not in iconography, but in the book Revelation. Now I saw in heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word, Logos of God, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One can argue that this Dionysian imagery in the text itself with him treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. In fact, that words in Greek, oinu, Theu Pantokratos, wine of the god Pantokrator. Sabazian titles all over the place in this passage itself. Also, the horse rider, just like we see with Zalmoxis, Mithras, and other Sabazian imagery. In the same way Sabazio is being slain as the bull, Christ was slain on the cross, but Sabazius is also the horse rider, so he is triumphant and is also slain, showing two different cosmic visions of this god. The name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, gives me the image of Dionysus being in the thigh 
eye of his father, Zeus. What makes this text so intriguing to this discussion is that it is written and set in Western Turkey, the island of Patmos by John, the very region who's writing to the seven churches of Asia in Western Turkey, the very region where this iconography of Sabazius and Mithras are depicted as horse riders, slaying dragons and being flanked by angels in the heavens. Sometimes the depiction is of the invincible sun on a chariot. This image of Mithras cap flanked by an eagle, riding the horse, holding the spear, slaying a dragon or serpent, and oftentimes with a solar halo on his head as the invincible sun. This is a specific image that can also be seen previously with Zelmoxis, who like I said, is Semele's son, who we already demonstrated is basically the god Dionysus by the Dacians, and his iconography, also holding a spear, flanked by an eagle, killing a dragon or a serpent, and is triumphant over nature. But this god is rooted in the more ancient Sabasius. Long before the birth of Greek Dionysus, another Dionysus was born to Zeus and Persephone, who some people have called Sabasius, and celebrated his birth with secret sacrifices at night. This Sabasius, who is Dionysus, is also depicted with the same spear, same eagle, killing the same snake. This very model that the Christians in the 5th century used to depict Saint George, as well as Saint Demetrius, and possibly even Jesus in Revelation. Demetrius of Thessalonica, who also is a horse riding hero who i mentioned was the last priest for demeter the grain goddess also a religion central to dionysus this grain goddess mother demeter the female counterpart to the vine god dionysus who visits demetrius in the dream tell him to close down the temple of eleusis but to reapply the rites that were central to Dionysus, Cori, or Virgin, and Demeter, which was the rituals of the secret mysteries that involved a Eucharist, a drink made from wine and grain, blood and bread, of Dionysus and Demeter. It is also reported by Demosthenes that the rites of Eleusis were brought from Phrygian rites of Sabao, or what is known as the rites of Sabasius and the Great Mother. Baptisms were involved, and those who drank from the cup of Kaikion were taken over by the God and saved from death, an undeniable salvation cult which was so famous that Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Cleopatra, Julia Domna, Caesar, Alexander the Great, Olympias, and even kings from India came to be saved by the god Dionysus by taking part in his Eucharist and being initiated. If this does not show you the close proximity between the Eleusinian mysteries and Christianity, then I think you are just not immersed in the history or the primary text and are too stuck in SBL Bible bubble land, trying everything in your dogmatic power to make Judeo-Christianity into some pure religion that has no influences from any of the dirty pagan religions. As Azel Mox's professor Hans Kloff, also a classical philologist who wrote extensively on this subject, has declared that Saint Demetrius inherits his role from Dionysus and the pagan goddess Demeter. After the demise of the Eleusinian mysteries, Dionysus and Demeter's cult in the 4th century and the Greek rural population had gradually transferred her rights and roles of the most famous universal religion of Eleusis in Athens onto the Christian Saint Demetrius. And this wasn't just some random thing either. Famous legends were written by Christians in this time period, making Demetrius into a miracle wonder working saint. In some legends, the goddess Demeter, in the form of an angel, came to Demetrius in his sleep and told him to worship Christ who is the true God. And if you know anything about the religion surrounding Dionysus, Demeter telling someone to worship Christ is almost exactly what Demeter would tell to ancient pagans to do for Dionysus. This is just a fact. The legend of Saint Demetrius makes Christ into the new Dionysus. And like St. Demetrius and St. George, there are countless of saints that replace the pagan heroes of the old pagan religion. For example, St. Sozon, which means Saint Savior, whose meekness becomes a model to live after. And even as obvious as St. Orpheus, who plays the lyre like Orpheus from Greek mythology and had the power to play music that was so heavenly and beautiful that it can cure sins and cause the wicked to stop sinning and follow Christ. In the midst of Orpheus, who was also a Thracian bard from the region that Zelmoxis and Sabasius was worshipped, and was also the high priest of Dionysus and the son of Apollo, who had the power to perform music that was so beautiful that it could heal the sick and make 
animals peaceful and come to listen to him. And as I've mentioned many times in this channel, St. Clement of Alexandria, who used Bacchic imagery inverted to portray Christ as the vine, but made Dionysus into the devil, but also called Christ the new Orpheus, singing the song of salvation. Christ was depicted in early Christian catacombs as a new Orpheus, and some of these catacombs even have Orpheus himself playing the lyre. Christ can also be seen as the good shepherd shown like Orpheus, surrounded by animals, but holding his cross rather than the lyre. Some of the earliest Christian mosaics portray Christ in the same way as other mosaics portray Orpheus. Orpheus was written about by Alexandrian Jews speaking Greek in the first century before Christ as a prophet of God who revealed the future. Orpheus, known as the theologian, the Logos, and whose texts were known as apocalypses or revelations, was a part of the Greek-speaking Jewish culture at the time when Christ was becoming known. Those are just a few examples. The image of the phoenix, the ancient symbol of death and resurrection, as most people don't know, was for a long time a pagan symbol that was repurposed as a symbol for Christ's nature of dying and resurrecting. But the true origins and context behind the phoenix was a Bacchic symbol of transformation and metamorphosis that Prometheus and Dionysus alone had the power to bestow on mortals who were in need of salvation from a bad destiny. Most who know ancient Greek mythology know that bad destiny was only shifted by Dionysus or Prometheus who can alter the course of actions either by madness or by stealing fire. Bacchus was the main god who dies, turns to ashes, and rises into a new god. Dionysus was the main god who dies, turns to ashes, and rises into a new god, the symbol of the phoenix. Clement of Rome in the first century, one of the oldest Christian texts that we have, writes about the phoenix in his letter and tells the same phoenix mythology for Christ as was, as was once told for Dionysus and Prometheus. In this woman, as fair as a goddess, mixed them a mess of Promian wine, Dionysus blood. She grated goat's milk cheese into it with a bronze grater, threw it in a handful of white barley meal, Demeter's body, and having thus prepared the mess, she bade for them to drink Homer Iliad. The body of Christ and the blood of the Eucharist is the Kaikia. Circe brought them in and made them sit on chairs and seats and made for them a potion of cheese and barley meal, Demeter's body, and yellow honey with Promian and wine, Dionysus blood. But in the food she mixed baneful drugs that they might utterly forget their native land, Homer's Odyssey. You see the imagery of the Eucharist in the text of Homer. The Metanera offered Demeter a cup having filled it with honey sweet wine, Dionysus blood. But she refused, saying that it was divinely ordained that she not drink red wine. Then Demeter ordered Metanera to mix some barley, Demeter's body, and water with delicate penuroil and give it to Demeter, that potion to drink. So Matanera made the Kaikion. Demeter and Dionysus and offered it to the goddess just as she had ordered it. Homer's hymn to Demeter. Around the year 200 BCE, less than a century after the so-called translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek known as the Septuagint, Many Greek-speaking Jews who already were living in Egypt and traveling to Cyprus, Crete, and Cilicia, and Greek culture and Jewish culture was beginning to mix. Antiochus III, the Great, who assumed the title of Great King, the traditional title of the ancient Persians that put him in direct conflict with the Roman Republic, which was at that time the hegemon of the entire Mediterranean world, and had the Macedonian king Perseus under house arrest, the last king of the Macedonians, in an attempt to restructure the power that Rome had already accumulated. Antiochus attempted to get King Perseus of Macedon to align with his Seleucid Empire, and he even attempted to make alliances with Mithridates III of Pontus in Turkey through a marriage, as well as Hannibal, the famous Carthaginian who was still alive in spite of losing wars to Scipio in Rome. Antiochus did all this in order to regain hegemon on the Mediterranean by the Seleucid Kingdom over the Romans and Ptolemies in Egypt, but was eventually on 
unsuccessful. These events lay the backdrop for the events that went down in the biblical book of Daniel. The reason why I bring all this up is because all of the religions of these kingdoms were Dionysian to the core, and what we would call religious is synonymous Dionysian. The following events, in my opinion, is what led to the rise of Christianity. Please try to follow along with me for a moment. This may get confusing at times. In 192 BC, Antiochus led an invasion into Greece with an army of 10,000 soldiers and was appointed as the supreme military leader of the Aetolian League. Keep in mind, the Greeks under King Perseus were just a puppet army for the Roman Republic at the time, and the Aetolian League was a scattered confederation of city-states consisting of Athens, Corinth, Delphi, and other places in the Balkans that were anti-Roman and pro-Seleucid Greek. However, in 191 BC, the Roman Roman forces led by Manius Glabrio decisively defeated Antiochus at Thermopylae, compelling him to retreat to Asia Minor and forced him to give up all his naval ships and trade routes to the point of the eventual collapse of the Seleucids within a century. The Romans, capitalizing on their victory, proceeded to invade Anatolia, the critical triumph of Scipio Asiaticus, the Battle of Magnesia and Sipilum in 190, coupled with Hannibal's naval defeat near Sidae, resulted in Asia Minor falling under Roman control. Following these events, the Treaty of Epimea was signed in 188 BC. Under this treaty, Antiochus gave up the control of the territories north and west of the Taurus Mountains, which the Roman Republic then distributed mostly to its allies, Rhodes and Eumenides II of Pergamon, while many Greek cities gained independence, but with paying reverence and taxes to Rome. This agreement significantly weakened the Seleucid Greek Empire Empire, prompting distant provinces previously claimed by Antiochus to declare their independence. Antiochus III embarked on another campaign in Luristan in the east, but his life ended in 187 BCE, while he was looting the Temple of Bel in Elymias, Persia. As a major result of this defeat of the Eastern Greeks, who at this time were in possession of all of Syria and Judea, two million Jewish refugees to Pergamon, Cappadocia, Phrygia, Caria, and Byzantium were sent as refugees, which is what I was telling the story for, and even as far as Thrace, Jewish refugees. The reason why this is such a big deal for this video is due to the cultural ramifications of this event. On one hand, a Dionysian Sabasian religion of the Phrygians and Cappadocians is already dominant in the region. On the other hand, Millions of Jews are now settling in large urban areas controlled by Rome but culturally Greek who worship Dionysus, etc. In my opinion, this is how we get Christianity. Just as millions of Jews are taken to Alexandria by Ptolemy in 300 BC after he wins a major war at Gaza against Demetrius, we also see millions of Jews being relocated to Asia Minor and the result is cultural fusion of these people in these regions. Serapis and Dionysus, two gods who are often synced by Greco-Roman writers, are competing with Yahweh as the philosophy of Platonism and Stoicism began to influence theologians simultaneously, making the backdrop or soil for Christian theology to sprout from. This does not mean that Jesus did not exist, that his ideas are not his, but it does tell us a lot about the culture in which the Gospels are being written under. To make this more apparent, Paul, who's from Tarsus, the port city, of Cilicia, which was also at one point the capital of the Mithraic pirates, defeated by Pompey, which is where Egyptians from Alexandria and Greeks from Asia Minor traded daily back and forth and was a culturally rich city that blended Mithraic, Dionysian, and Jewish under the Roman control, the place where Paul was from. In my opinion, this is how the Bacchic religion of Sabasius became the religion of Theos Hypsistos, God Most High, the first major monotheistic religion of Greek paganism. In fact, Hypsisterians, as they are called, styled themselves as Sabaminoi in Corinth. A few of these tablets list the members of more exclusive groups that call themselves worshippers of Theos Hypsistos, God Most High, Sabaminoi of Theos Hypsistos. The term Sabaminoi is used 
in the New Testament to describe a group of Judaizing pagans, but it is issued more widely in the Greek world to refer to worship of reverence without any special technical meaning. The word can break down into seboi menoi, which shows relations to sebasius, possibly through the root word seboi, which means revered one. They practice Orphic religion with Neo-Pythagorean philosophical doctrines, Middle Platonist leanings, which include Stoicism and philosophical forms of the good. They worship one God who seems to transcend all time and space, but allow for this one or monad to reveal itself through a logos. The word Eucharist itself is not a Hebrew or Jewish concept. It breaks down to you meaning good and charis meaning grace. It is a common word throughout Greek literature for giving thanks to the gods. The god Mithras, who I already mentioned, is shown to have much overlap in the Dionysian and is known to have given Eucharist involving bread and wine long before Christianity was even in existence. And even in contemporary sources, the Mithraic and Dionysian Eucharist were so common that we can find traces of them in the archaeology across the entire Roman Empire. My point being is that not one religion owns this or deserves a patent for it. It is just a part of religious observance across the board, just like frankincense and myrrh, even if they have a fake folk etymology found in the Bible, which are proven to be false, we can find sources that predate these texts that use these words. Cappadocians, the eastern neighbors to the Bacchic Phrygians, were always in close proximity to the Armenians, Caucasians, Persians, as well as the Cilician pirates below them, who were followers of the Zenavesta and the Gothas, written by Zoroaster. These very Cappadocians are the mixing pot of these religions that eventually lead to Christianity. Cappadocian church fathers are very influential later on, and they seem to be able to absorb a wide-ranging amount of philosophical and mystical doctrine that become entwined. I think it is highly probable that these are the very intellectuals who are able to find a middle ground between the Western Dionysian and the Eastern Mazdakite thinking. Theos Hypsistos, influenced by Ahura Mazda from Zeus Sabazios, Dionysian Zeus, is the evolution of a god via the vehicle of Platonic thought that brings about the doctrine of the One or Monad. Hypsisterians are a highly advanced Greek-speaking pagan Jewish syncretic religion that arose around the first century BC of the Common Era, congruent with Christianity, and in many cases overlap with Christianity. It is related in several sources, such as Gregory of Nyssa or Gregory of Nazianzus, that these groups are in close proximity to Christianity and both are borrowing philosophically from each other. These Hypsisterians, with their core roots in the Dionysian, worshipped one god and one god only. Theos Hypsistos, God Most High, also called Zeus Hypsistos, and in some cases, Sabasius Hypsistos. This god gets his theology from Pythagorean and Platonic principles, such as we see with Judeo-Christianity. He is outside space and time, he is in control of the cosmos, and his inherits are saved by being initiated into his cult. They reject idolatry, practice piety, honest living, humility, and are God-fearing. Professor John Kloppenborg points out that both Christian assemblies and Hypsisterian assemblies are almost identical in the way that they run their cults. Dionysian elements are apparent within the both cults as well. An inscription in pre-Christian Nicaea reads, Yo Megalo Theo Upsisto kai eperonio kai tois anios atu angloi kai te pruskugete atu prosuke tai ode erga gainetai for the great heavenly god most high theos hypsistos and his holy angels and for his prayer house for worshiping where his deeds are done the imagery can't get more Judeo-Christian than that. Theos Hypsistos, which means God Most High, is the same title used in the Bible to describe God in the Old and New Testament. Pantocrator and Cosmocrator are also titles given to this God. They worship this God with no images, and they believe in him to be supreme, require no circumcision, and do not require Jewish law to be necessary for salvation, especially circumcision. He is flanked by his angels. This makes it even more intriguing that it is found in this exact same location that Christianity arose from. Remember, Christianity is not a Jewish religion from Israel, but more of a Greek religion from the region of Asia Minor where the inscription is found. Hence the seven churches of Asia and Pergamum, Ephesus, and Constantinople being the capital of the Christian world.
But what does this have to do with Dionysus, you ask? Hypsistos, God Most High, is a title that is commonly used for both Yahweh in the Old Testament, as well as Zeus, Aranos, but also Dionysus, Apollo, and Zalmoxis, the various sun gods, and especially the Persian Ahura Mazda. But with all those titles out of the way, Jesus is called Cosmocrator and Hypsistos, titles that are also applied to Theos Hypsistos. Theos Hypsistos, which means God Most High, is a common title for the God of the Hebrew Bible along with El Elyon in Hebrew, but it also becomes the main name of the Platonic Good, the monotheistic God of the monoplatonic period that combines Stoicism and Platonism. Theos Hypsistos replaces the name of the Dionysian God, Sabasius, over time. When religion, dominated by Platonism, begins to replace revelry and mania with piety and humility. To show how this is the case, Sabasius was also called Hypsistos for most of his existence, and in Asia Minor, especially the regions of Phrygia and Cappadocia, Sabasius Hypsistos is slowly becoming only called Zeus Hypsistos or Theos Hypsistos. Sabasius is the rendering of the Chthonic, nightly, while Zeus is the Hypsistos being the highest. Sabasius' hands are a relic. Like the Terabolium and the Crucifix, Hand of Sabasius becomes a magic icon for the god. The Hand of Sabasius, the oldest known image of what became in Latin as the Benedicto Latina gesture. As we can see here, thumb up, two fingers up, two fingers down. Very specific hand gesture. Noticing the hands always depict the dragon who sits in its roots in Hades and reaches the heavens, that the mother giving birth to the child at the winter solstice. The beginning of time and the birth of the divine child is the first hand, the second hand representing springtime, which is the lunar month of the lunar bowl, which is the time for plants and flowers to bloom. The third hand of Sabasius, the solar month, the month of heat. It is almost undeniable that the early depictions of Jesus are using the same Roman Benedicto Latina gesture, which was originally an ancient Dionysian hand symbol of piety, repurposed for Jesus. This is not even a conspiracy. This is a specific symbol, which again, originated with the holiness of Dionysus and it's passed down to Jesus. Here is Demeter, who is Dionysus' female counterpart in the mysteries, making use of such a gesture back in an image from 500 BC. As we can see, this is used by royals, not just cultists. Here is Augustus, who was also initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries of Dionysus and Demeter, waving this symbol of peace to the people. This is the original image of that hand gesture, and it is purely Dionysian. Early images of Jesus show him with this hand symbol. The name Sabasius means free or peace in Thracian and Dacian, probably due to the interlocking of people having freedom during times of peace. The words Theosabase, that is used in Paul to refer to God fearers, as I already mentioned, has Sabase rooted in there. The core religious cultic term of being free, holy, peaceful, and in the grace of the gods. Sabasius is often pictured with animal and bird figures as a turtle, a frog, a bee, a lizard, an owl, and elsewhere on the hand are shown as a scarab. We also find the eagle of Zeus, which later becomes the standalone image used for Theos Hypsistos, God Most High in Greco-Jewish syncretic circles of Asia Minor. This same eagle symbol, which frequently surmounts Sabasius' extended index and middle fingers perching on a thunderbolt on the bronze hands, which shows Sabasius associated with Zeus just as he is with Dionysus, making him a god, the father, and the son godhead. A series of musical instruments like the Sistrum of Isis, a cymbal or two cymbals, a double flute, Phrygian pipes, and the lyre of Apollo are found on some examples. A few hands hands have on the wrist a semicircular cavern enclosing the figure of a reclining mother nursing her child, the divine child image which is present in the Gospel of Luke. Sabasius is associated with Mercury, who is called the Logos, the Word of God, long before Jesus. Not less than 12 of the known hands are decorated with busts or heads of this god Mercury, possibly acting as the Logos or Word of Sabasius, like his angel or messenger, wearing the winged sand in addition to his winged staff of caduces, which shows Sabasius as a god of the afterlife and salvation from death. Sabasius, the Eastern Dionysus from Phrygia and Cappadocia, 
began to evolve with the times. The religion of Sabasius was commonly equated with the title De Sedemena, a term that means religious feeling, which is also a term that was commonly used in close proximity to the term Theosabes, or God fear. Theos Hypsistos, which means God Most High, is also a term associated with Theos Sabes and Deci Dema. So over time, these terms became synonymous with each other, meaning God fearers or religious feeling, and a religious movement of piety and devotion to the Most High became a popular movement in a world of mystery schools and religious circles. Zoroastrianism through the Cappadocians and Armenians of Armenia was a religion that held these principles central to its tenets. Very soon, Bacchic adherents began to call themselves Magi. Fire veneration became a central doctrine among its adherents. It wasn't long before Judeo-Christian principles made its way into the fold. Finally, at the last stage of this religion's evolution was the mingling with the newly acquired migrants from Judea that were moved from Antiochus III around 200 BC, as well as the Jewish diaspora from 70 AD and Bar Kokhba in 135 AD due to the total annihilation of the Temple of Jerusalem and the last wave of wars waged by Hadrian that brought many Jews to Pergamon, who, like the Jews before them, began to assimilate to the culture of the region. Many of these poor, down on their luck, were receptive to the idea of a Messiah who would come to bring revenge and peace to the world. This is the perfect location for Christianity to grow out of, between the Bacchic salvation of Eleusis, Mithraic magic of cosmic justice, and the promise of a divine savior hero, a Christ or an anointed one. Asia Minor became the hot spot for religious syncretism and reform that was ripe for growth of a Christian religion that opposed the imperial cult like many countercultures throughout history and thus it became that. People were sold immediately to this promise of salvation and took no time for someone like Constantine to move the capital from Rome to Constantinople where the cultural capital was. The promise of a savior king that would enter Jerusalem on a donkey would sound familiar to the Greek ear as they would know about Dionysus, the promised savior, entering Athens, or in some cases Thebes, on a donkey in his triumphal entry surrounded by his disciples of satyrs and maenads play the music while he makes his triumphal entry. This is exactly the kind of interpretatio graeca, Greek translation, which interpretation by means of Greek models, the tendency of the ancient Greeks and Romans to identify foreign deities with their own gods. Plutarch in the early second century identifies Dionysus with Yahweh, saying they are the same god, Yao. Even the Chaldean oracles call Dionysus by the name of Yao. This would lead to the author of the Gospel of John to re write the synoptics into a Dionysian tragedy as laid out by Dennis MacDonald in the Dionysian Gospel and create a story of Christ called the true vine, not the false one. Christ becomes the new Dionysus of salvation and Dionysus becomes the Antichrist and the horned devil leading the impure satyrs who literally become the image of the demon, showing that even a polemic this strong against the old ways of paganism can have such a lasting effect that the core imagery still exists, and that is how the Dionysian religion influenced Christianity. You have just attained true gnosis.